without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Hugh Thomas just to uh, introduce um, the, uh, the drive behind this. Hugh. Thank you, John. Uh, good morning, everybody, uh, and welcome to the webinar. Um, just to explain my role, I'm, I'm the Managing Director of Puffin Produce. It's my kind of day job, but I also um, am on the Food and Drink Wales Industry Board that has been going, you know, perhaps, what is it, about half a dozen years now. Um, and one of the work streams we developed as a board is, is a work stream that will help businesses in Wales develop their financial skills. Um, that was kind of put into a block of what support was needed. And that block of work is being delivered by BIC. Um, so hence, John kind of chairing this meeting today, you know, Linda and Alan, um, who've been working on this program now for a good few years. Um, the program that, that they developed is called the Investor Ready Program. Some of you probably heard of it before. There's a whole range of tools available within that program. And what I would uh, um, recommend is that if anybody's got any kind of questions or feel they can improve their systems within their business, then please contact one other team from BIC. You know, I think that's probably my opening statement. Um, so I thought part of that program is, you know, is why we're here today, doing a series of webinars to, you know, to just talk about the various areas of concern within within food businesses in Wales and what we can all do and you know just throw a few ideas about it, I think it is as well you know I'm, I'm interested to, to hear what comes up today myself to be honest you know perhaps there's something there on risk mitigation that we haven't really thought about well enough in Puffin you know so I'm just going to uh, sit and listen as well so uh, so press back to you John. Thank you Hugh thank you so we have um, Rob from Capestone Organic Alan Lewis, the FD from Big Innovation, Marlies from Capital Law, and Pete from Food and Drink Federation in Wales. And uh, myself, uh, being a f um, I've got some previous in food and drink myself. I'm here to, to facilitate. Um, so what are we here for? Well, today we're discussing forecasting, what do we think might happen, and risk management, what do we think we can do about it? Um, Strangely, nobody's really managed to forecast this year so far, and it's becoming increasingly difficult to forecast what might, what might happen before the end of the year. The big variables for food and drink companies, of course, are things like currency, supply, demand, and latterly, consumer sentiment. For example, does anybody know if we're going to do a hard Brexit? Um, are we going to have a second wave of COVID before the end of the year? Christmas, will consumers come out and celebrate or will they stay at home and expect everything to be delivered? What can we do? Well, we can forecast, uh, but we can ask our customers to forecast and we can ask our suppliers to forecast. Hedging, um, always sounds like some mystical thing you do with somebody in the city. In reality, it's that practice of breaking risk down and buying or selling forward and trying to mitigate some of the risks as comes from those things that we can't insure for. We can try and insure. Do we have alternatives? Have we got more than one supplier or more than one customer if things don't go the way we thought they might do? Do we understand our business cycle, seasonal sales? After all, we have Christmas coming. And how do we plan for that? And what might or might not happen? Because, of course, all of this relies us relies on us having enough working capital. If we don't forecast, we don't know how much working capital we might require or whether we need additional funding or some sort of contingency. So to help us discuss that, we have a panel. Um, and I'm going to jump on Rob straight away because Rob has got some previous as a in the major multiple retailers, both here and on Australia. But of course at Capestone, he's a very busy boy growing meat for major multiples who will be relying on it for Christmas. Rob, what's going to happen for the rest of the year and what are you doing about it? Uh, morning, everyone. Um, I was a bit like you, really. I was hoping for some more, more answers. Um, that just in terms of, I suppose, from a Cape Stone perspective, the way we're looking at it, there's, there's a very sort of physical element of how you're managing risk from a production perspective and starting with people really at the moment being the number one issue for us in terms of keeping our team and our people safe. Um, so we've put a lot of time and effort into that. We've put a lot of resources into doing it. And, you know, we're fortunate that we're a, 
a medium sized bigger business, I suppose, by Welsh food industry standards. So we've actually been fortunate enough to be able to do it. Um, it certainly hit the budget in terms of costs in the early part of the, the pandemic. Um, so yeah, part of it's been around physical in terms of how we manage people and the processes. The, the customer piece, um, very difficult to predict. Um, and not getting caught with either too many or too few chicken, um, when you grow all of them and the lead time is sort of six months is very tricky. <coughs> Excuse me, I did, you know, predicting Christmas. So our, we've probably got probably about 80% of our Christmas turkeys are now in sheds or just coming out of the hatchery. So our Christmas is already done um, in one sense. The retail customers we supply are having the size of turkey they've already ordered. They ordered them in January. But what's really interesting, of course, is everyone's double guessing what sort of Christmas we're going to have. And the number of phone calls I've had saying, can you make them bigger? Can you make them smaller? Um, can you change how many we've got? Um, the, the, the retail side actually don't know what Christmas is going to look like at the moment. Um, and the second wave is a big, big issue um, for them. So will people be at home? I, th I think food service, we don't really supply into. So in one sense, I haven't got that headache of wondering whether it's going to restart in, 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 in earnest. Um, but double guessing Christmas is a, is a challenge. We've, um, I'll, I'll talk about sort of the, the other parts of the physical risk is make, making sure we've got enough processing capacity. So we'll probably buy a new packing machine. Um, we don't need a new packing machine, but we need the capacity if we lose people. Um, so if anybody has got any bright ideas out there in terms of we'll probably bring in to just short of 200 agency staff um, for five weeks this Christmas. Um, that's because you want the, the agency will also help take some of the risk for you in terms of ensuring you've got people? Yeah, the you know if any if any year we could offer local employment, this would be this would be it really in terms of applicants we've had for jobs recently. Um, but in terms of helping us manage the risk, then using a professional agency for that short period is by far the easiest option and, and the, the lowest risk. Um, and we've worked with them for years. Hugh, is it much the same for you? Because you do you get a big season up list uplift at Puffin, do you not? Yeah, mm, to a certain extent, but the, 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 the bit with the most uplift is, is in the, the potato operation and we, we're relatively automated there now, John, but uh, you know, what we try and do then is spread what crops we grow, you know, we're doing more veg all the time, cauliflowers and leeks and things, try and spread it evenly throughout the year so that we can take staff on permanently, you know, it's, you know, it's we've, we've tended to kind of stay away from the, the seasonal work of it because it's so hard to do as you know but yeah. the robber has got no other choice i think you know is it in the you know, is, turkeys for christmas then uh you know it is it is a seasonal job isn't it so we've tried tended to stay the other end because it is so difficult especially our geographic location is very hard to get agency labor you know in this part of wales we're so remote from where these people live and how good are your customers at forecasting what they're going to require from you? Um, well, I think we're better than they are, put it like that. So, um, you know, but we talk to them, you know, we, the, our half dozen biggest retail customers, you know, we probably speak to them virtually every day, John, you know, and it's this continual dialogue, you know, if you had, you know, what are you thinking about Christmas? Has it changed from last week? You know, these type of things is an ongoing dialogue as well, you know, and then, you know, it's trying to get some commitment from them as well of what, you know, if they're going to drive promotions, you know, it, they can control what volume that promotion is by the price point that they put on it. So if they commit and to it, agree. you know, they can, they can help you mitigate risk and yeah. help you guarantee volumes as well. And they give you sight of their marketing plan and their promotions and agree with you what they'll do and when. Yeah, and that is, you know, some retailers do that almost nine months in advance now, John. You know, some are more 
then more reactive to the market, what the competitors do. There's a whole range of stuff in there, really. So, uh, you know, we have to keep up with that every day, really. But it's, you know, as you, something like, as Rob just said, you know, we, we grow potatoes. They come out of the ground now in September and October, and that's it set, you know. We can't, we can't kind of miracle up any more potatoes in January, you know, because uh, the harvest has been done and we've got to work with what we got, you know. So it's, it's then balancing the demands of the different customers. You know, it's one of the things that we're concerned about going into the into the this coming season is retail sales are still very strong now in the veg sector. They're probably 20% up now. You know, that's the volume that's been taken out of the food service sector and is is in retail. So, you know, how are we going to balance that going through the coming years is a, is a again a kind of a factor that we're discussing with retailers. And just on that one, what are the key variables for them? Because I assume that you've got the price settled, but will currency or packaging supply or other inputs be uh, less manageable? Yeah, well, packaging is an interesting one because <clears throat> that was one of the, the probably the, the area that became closest to falling over during the kind of panic buying period, you know, March and April. It's, uh, you know, we had enough potatoes here and enough capacity here to kind of deal with the 100% extra volume that we had for three weeks. But uh, but this, the same demand came from everybody to the packaging manufacturers. We work with a company called Ultimate that up in Doncaster that are the lead supplier for Tesco's and on a, you know, on a whole range of products, you know, and they were really struggling. So, um, you know, the, the retailers are, and we as a business now are looking at mitigating that risk more, making sure that packaging supplies are more evenly spread. So that means more suppliers rather than relying on, on getting the keenest price out of one big supplier. Yeah. And it has to be, and I think, you know, the supermarkets will work with these, Packaging suppliers, the retailers direct the packaging suppliers, uh, suppliers to make sure there's capacity, capacity in these suppliers. Because if, you know, obviously the most efficient businesses are, are there, the ones who are running at 100%, you know, they're sweating their assets and then there is no, there is no room for uplift. So what, I mean, from your point of view, I mean, hopefully nothing will go wrong, but is it people or is it physical capacity uh, uh, and the logistics of getting stuff to market? that's at risk for you? Yeah, but, you know, as I think Rob, Rob said people first, and I think I would say people first as well. You know, we work hard every day here to try and get the team as good as we can and, you know, look after our team, keep the team, team safe. I suppose if you, you know, we're, we're looking at the biggest risk of a business like this is having an outbreak in the business, you know? So yeah. these things that we're doing every day of different canteens and different shifts and different teams, everybody, you know, splitting everybody up. So if one small group do get the virus, then only kind of half a dozen people go off and it's not spread right through the factory because that's the biggest risk. You know, it's uninsurable. It's, uh, you know, and it closes you down. So uh, that's the one we spend most of our time on. Yeah. In fact, um, if I can come to you, Pete, you were relaying your story just before we started about being let down by a major supplier. Um, I mean, it does happen, doesn't it? I mean, I know from my from my background in dairy, when force majeure is is declared, do you want to just just relay that story a, a, again for us because it's quite perhaps illustrative of what potentially can go wrong. Yeah, I mean, I think what's interesting about forecasting is obviously it's, it's the the session is very much about following the cash, but the reality is you also need to follow the flow of your materials. And by materials, it's not just about the materials that go in your products. Think about spare parts for your equipment, things of that nature. Uh, the situation that happened for us when I was MD at D-side Cereals was in the run-up to Brexit on March 2019. And uh, we had a, a contract for one particular ingredient that out of, the, out of the 40 products that the business made went into 39 of those products. And it was absolutely vital. And it was a commodity. So uh, we, it was a commodity we imported. And then around the middle of January, I was serviced what's called a force majeure contract, which basically says, although we've got a contract until the end of June, in the event, in the event of a no-deal breakfast, we are releasing ourselves from that contract and we will not be supplying you forthwith. So that's, uh, I, I was quite a shock. Uh, we were fortunate the commodity is found in the UK, so we were able, but if I give you a sense of scale, uh, the price went up by 25% on something that was hundreds of pounds a ton to get it sourced from the UK. So uh, I think and Marley's is a far greater expert than I in terms of contracts, but for me, what I would be doing is 
mapping the sources of all the materials that you have coming into your business. Yeah, in fact, we've had a, a question from Alison along the same subject of about, you know, when you produce a finite amount of uh, product and a customer demands more, where, where, where do you stand? Marlies, I mean, we're into that lovely bit about when we're drawing up contracts and selling stuff, everything's sweet and rosy until, of course, you know, much later when we all fall out because that's not my understanding of what we said we could do. Absolutely. I mean, first of all, uh, it, it's quite often the case in the food and drink industry that people don't have contracts because they start off as small businesses. You don't have the cash to spend on expensive lawyers. Uh, you trust uh, the people you're dealing with and then things go wrong. And um, then you grow bigger. You might import, export. You deal, as we said, maybe with one major supplier. And then you have this issue with bargaining power. You know, if you are a small supplier and you're dealing with one of the big supermarkets, of course, uh, you know, they have got the resources um, to come down on you heavy with the contracts and lawyers and so on. And, but really, when it comes down to it, very often, uh, if you have a, a well drawn up contract, you can actually protect yourself. And um, I think one of the most important things is actually now, as we faced with the, the double whammy of, of, of COVID and Brexit, and it looks, you know, as we said earlier, increasingly like a hard Brexit, um, have a look at the contracts you've got in place, because um, there may be force majeure co uh, contracts clauses in there, um, but they don't always work. They don't always bite. You know, sometimes they... Um, um, are drafted in such a woolly way that you can get out of it. Um, sometimes um, they are too narrow, so there may be a contract that just lists four or five things, but it doesn't have sort of like a sweeper clause, like you know anything beyond the control of the third parties. But even if you've got one of those uh, contracts and they they are drafted quite soundly, you still have to sort of like look at what, what did the parties actually know? Did they mitigate? Um, so, you know, we said earlier, I think you mentioned about making sure the workforce is safe. Um, if the government gives guidelines on how to keep your workforce safe and you ignore them and then you hit with a second wave of coronavirus, can't supply and say to your customer, you know, force majeure can't supply because of second wave, they could come back to you and say, well, hang on, have you actually followed guidelines? No, you haven't. So therefore, you know, your force majeure is pretty valueless. So, you know, there's lots of things that uh, you have to sort of like uh, consider. Yeah, about. I mean, that reminds me, Molly, is that a lot of these companies, particularly the smaller food and drink companies, may not even be limited companies. Is it important to have a structure that gives you some final legal protection? Yeah, I think if you if you can incorporate, that would definitely be be helpful because if you are hit with sort of like a big liability and you just can't get out of it, then, uh, it, you know, you would not be personally liable unless, of course, you give personal guarantees, but that's a separate session. Um, but generally, yes, that would, that would protect you. So, I mean, uh, put the right structure in place for, for your own uh, enterprise. Also, very, very important, know who you're dealing with. Um, I, I say that quite often for people who start exporting. Um, you know, you start exporting, it's so exciting and common sense goes out of the window and you don't actually know who you're dealing with. And, you know, I've had a number of, of, of contracts that people have given to me and said, oh, can you just have a last check? Everything's fine, but I just want you to look at it. And said, so I, I looked at it and especially like African countries or South American ones. And uh, these so-called companies don't even exist. So be very, very careful. Be very careful how you protect your, your cash flow. If you are dealing with somebody you don't know, don't give them credit terms straight away. Um, make, make sure that you have got proper procedures in place. And most importantly, also put, put contracts in place. You know, In some countries, especially if you want to export, you have to have contracts in writing in the food and, and drink industry. Um, but as an absolute minimum, you've got to regulate things like payment, delivery, delivery terms, and um, you know the, these these kind of things. So so you've mentioned that in amongst all that the bargaining power and a lot of the, the food and drink companies aren't that as big as their customers. I know Hugh and Rob um, have, have seen both sides of this. Rob, could you just that bargaining power? I mean, you, you're a decent sized company, but you still, I suspect, 
um, feel the pressure from from the marketplace? What 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 do you do in terms of just making sure that you um, have got something to stand on? Um, I think it comes back to getting the day job right as well. You know, the basics. Yeah, there's, there's, there's contract, there's leverage and negotiation, and all of those bits and pieces. But I think the first thing to do is make sure you give your customer what they want and don't give them too many reasons to come back and beat you up. Yeah, there's always going to be a bit of a negotiation around price. Um, but at the end of the day, if you've got something that they really want um, and it's differentiated to a point, then they, 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 they actually don't have as many options as you'd think. Um, that, that might be... <laughs> do you have more options though yourself as, as you've got bigger have you diversified your supply base in terms of feed and packaging and the like yeah I, you know i think you've always got to have a plan you've always got to have this is all about forecasting and risk you've always got a plan b but plan c plan d especially if you're going into a negotiation and you the potential is you might lose um a chunk of business or you might not be able to source the the inputs that you need you always need to have those backup plans so putting in all your eggs you know, pun from a poultry business but all the eggs in one basket has never been a good idea um, so certainly from our perspective um, we've looked over the last couple of years to grow um, the customer base um, certainly you know I know something that Puffin have done really well over the last sort of four or five years um, so we're looking to grow our customer base grow the type of customers um, you know, at the moment, we're not rushing towards food service, but we're doing a lot more um, B2B manufacturing product. Um, we have but that's some... more about getting out of the seasonal um, capacity constraint, if you like, doing more at the other times of the year? Yeah, so when we looked at the risk for our business just generally, it's before pandemic, we, we're quite fortunate in one sense that we, um, we think pandemic um, on a, a daily basis as a poultry business anyway. It's, it always affects the birds and not people. So in terms of our biosecurity, avian influenza, and there's a disease in Turkey it's called blackhead, which could effectively wipe out our, our turkey, uh, Christmas turkey business. So we, we're growing 25% less turkey this year than we did last year. Um, we're still predicting the same outturn for the, the whole of the year. We're growing more chicken, um, more customers. So yeah, we're, we're looking to really balance up the business and the risk. Um, That's interesting because one of the questions we've had um, we had uh, prior to, to this was um, from Craddock's asking about how people can diversify and where they find the time to uh, or the capacity uh, or just the headspace perhaps to think about new products and new markets and um, I think you, you've alluded to the fact that you've put extra manufacturing capacity in but I know Alan it's one of the things that um, uh, Welsh Government programs offer through smart isn't it in terms of helping people review how they can get more capacity and therefore space to do more or do different yes certainly just going back to the initial query of how much time should one spend on new product development uh, what tends to happen with certainly with smaller companies is the time spent on new product development is that time you've got left over after you've done absolutely everything else so I think the first step is to get out of that cycle. Um, product development is more important than just applying the leftover time. So the options there, I know it's very easy for me to sit here and uh, pontificate, but uh, the options are perhaps to improve your productivity so as you release more time. And, you know, just to think of one hypothetical um, solution, uh, it might be a case of finding more efficient machinery uh, that will release some of your time and that poses two questions immediately I suppose what sort of machinery and from where and the other side of it how do you fund it now the good thing about uh, big innovation is that we are uh, blessed with running more than one type of government program uh, some of them have a financial bent some of them have a productivity bent uh, who has mentioned Investor Eddy that I'm uh, leading on for Big Innovation. Uh, John there uh, mentioned the SMART programme, which is about productivity. 
uh, what we can do is not just send an accountant in to worry about the funding or just send a production person in to worry about the productivity. We can send a team in to worry about the entirety of the organisation. Uh, and yes, we don't come with uh, magic wands, but uh, you know we come with an awful lot of experience. Uh, most of the team are old and grey, like like me, uh, and we've been there and done that. So, uh, if anybody out there listening wishes to uh, engage with a team of financial orientated people, manufacturing orientated people, marketing orientated people, then please do give us a shout. Yeah, and I think the the, the investor ready program. One of the things it's demonstrated is is how it's helped cust, um, clients sort through some of those risks and look at, look at the alternatives, particularly around management information. I mean, I'm always amazed how many food and drink companies don't do as much forecasting, particularly on the cash front, as you, you'd think they would do. And I mean, Pete, I think I know that's something that's um, close to your heart is the, um, the sort of simple strategies that people should be maybe be thinking about now for forecasting cash position. How far ahead should they be thinking? Um, just before I come to that, John, I hope we don't mind. I'll just go back to Alison's question uh, because I think I think it's it's a it's a struggle that many many businesses have around balancing your customers and how to choose which customer. The only advice I could give is if you've got a problem, tell them early. I pick up Rob's point. What customers want is is the certainty. They want to know what's happening, especially in the retail environment. If you you don't one thing you don't want is empty shelves. And if someone can tell you, I mean, I had experience with it with a range of the retailers over years where you sometimes have to go down to them and not to tell them what you can do, but share with them what you can't do. And every single time I've done that early, it's been appreciated because by admitting you can't do things, you create trust and business is very much about trust. So for me, that would be my answer to Alice, yeah. Alice's specific question. In, te in, te in terms of how far you're forecasting, to a certain degree, obviously, the further you go, the more confusing it gets. Um, and I think, I think I, I, I would, t you know, you, you tend to work on a 13 week forecast horizon or tend to work on a one year sort of top line horizon, if you like. Um, if it was me, we've got this, we've got December 20. I'd want to know what's happening between now and March, if I was honest, uh, and as much detail as I possibly could. And I'd want to understand the, the ranges of it. I mean, obviously FDF, our clients are very, various different sizes. They've got various different capabilities to pick up Alan, Alan's point about what people can and can't do. Um, so what I would suggest to do is take a view. The one thing that, that, that concerns me at the moment is, you know, there's guys out there listening to this call. They've got so many things rattling around their head. It must be very difficult to sort of sit back and go, right, where do I draw the line here? There's so many different lines to draw. Where do I draw the line here? The only thing I could say is draw it somewhere. Draw it as you, you could call it a base case or something. What's the base case that could happen here? What's the minimum that could happen in terms of the scale of my business? And then maybe what you can do is you can build on that. You can build risks against that. If you, and, and the other reason why that's a useful way to do it is if you're going to a bank and you want to get money from a bank or money from the Development Bank of Wales who have been fantastic through this, um, the way they will look at it is they will look at your forecast base case and they will look at how strong that base case is and then they will risk assess all the items you add on to that. So if you cash flow in that way, and in two months' time, an Economic Resilience Fund 3 comes along, and instead of being about reductions in turnover, it's actually about working capital, because that's FDF's main concern is working capital as we build back, build the businesses back, you've got the type of model or the type of assessment that they will be able to connect with, and it means you're more likely to be successful. So one of the things that uh, I know some companies are adopting is working with suppliers on packaging, making sure that they've got that packaging and they've booked it, it's even maybe sat in a warehouse somewhere. Yep. They're not expected to pay for it now. They are expected to draw it down over, over the course of that period. But of course, um, you know, it's budgeting for that and ensuring that you, you get some sales in the meantime to fund for it, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I mean packaging, I, I agree with you. Packaging is a really interesting environment. You know, the, the development of Amazon has transformed the board packaging demand across the whole of the UK and the whole of the world, probably, and it's put a huge strain on it. But yes, packaging, you can buy three months out, you can buy six months out. Um, it's, interest, it's interesting that from a cost perspective, you know, the, 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 the longer runs they have and the longer scale that you can buy, the better. But um, it's, it's, it's not just packaging, it's, it's, it's 
key ingredients, it's, it's equipment. Well, clearly people are your number one priority because without yeah. people you ain't got a business. Um, and so from that point of view, I think you just have to have a set, set, set of 10 or 15, 10 assumptions, whatever they are, work them through, and then, then manage each of those individual assumptions and understand how solid they are. Um, mm. Recognizing that it's, it's an extremely fluid situation. So, um, funnily enough, because we've had a question come in from, from Mark Pavey, uh, I would just go to the second part of it in, in the short term, and, and maybe one for you, you Hugh. Um, is this, this business of, um, of deflation or inflation or stagflation or whatever, I mean, we're expecting a degree of inflation, are we not, next year? And we've already got baked in inflation because of some of the economic decisions and the, and the nature of the market. Um, are you budgeting for inflation or are your customers budgeting for inflation? <clears throat> um, some and some is the answer to that. I think, you know, we also are working really hard with, with the retailers who are getting ready, you know, for a recession. You know, they, the, the, the big retailers are very aware that how much Aldi and Lidl pushed forward. You know, but Aldi is one of our customers as well how much ground, ground they gained during the last recession. So, you know, the, the big retailers, you know, you've, Tesco's have been, have put this in the public domain, you know, they're, they're working hard to make sure that March doesn't happen again, you know. So there is a lot going on about, so you may see deflation, you know, you may see specs change and these type of things within and see deflation within our category to, to match the demands of a recession where people are becoming more price conscious. So you, but they, they were they were supply conscious when they couldn't get hold of toilet rolls and, and pasta and, and, and rice earlier in the year. Oh, do we should we assume that it's going to be about price, or do we think that availability and service, particularly if you don't fancy standing outside in a queue outside Aldi in October in the persistent rain, would would they pay a premium for their food at that point to be delivered? The point is, you know, customers are price sensitive, John. You know, it's, it's how they feel. You know, the Tesco's has done very well over the last couple of months, has not it? You know, and the, the smaller, apart from the convenience stores, the kind of smaller, large supermarket stores haven't done so well. People, I think, have felt a bit more cramped in those sort of things. So I think it will be depend whether a second wave comes, you know, on, on how each retailer performs. You know, I think if things quieten down now and there isn't a second wave, then we will see more of a move back to normality, I think, isn't it? So it's, uh, again, it, there's a heap of unknowns. You know, I think one, one of, you know, coming back to Alison's question as well is, you know, we try and be open, as transparent as we can with all our customers, going, this is what we've harvested. This is what you sold last year. So this is what we can do on top of that. You know, we, we try and treat everybody fairly and very, be very open and transparent about what we've got and how we can work. And again, give that data almost nine, ten months in advance. So... You know, if there's, they can change their retail strategy to match that, you know. If, uh, yeah. But some retailers, I mean, some retailers have, have, have seen a big growth, Ocado and Amazon, obviously, and with them, Amazon rolling out. Rob, you, you, you know that area probably better than most, and the change in maybe the structure. Do we think that structure is changing permanently and we should plan accordingly, or do we think that, that, that things will go back to what was normal before? Um, I think from our perspective, it's again, it's about risk, isn't it? Mitigation and hedging your bets. And you know, we've got one Bigfoot now very much in the, the Amazon camp and have seen the sales grow um, with the service they offer. Um, currently only really in the Southeast um, in terms of prime for, for food, but it's, yeah, it, it's gonna happen, it's gonna grow. Um, people have changed their habits and a proportion of people will stay with the convenience um, that Amazon and other online retailers offer. Um, so you'd look at it and say, yeah, for the next, depending on what happens, um, my personal view, so please don't go out and make lots of decisions based on this, but it would be, you know, the online has definitely been accelerated in terms of its uptake by customers and changing habits to a point during the pandemic, it's, it's yeah, we, we've seen the change. We, we, we think that might be a, a permanent, it's not that people will go back. Once they've had the convenience, they'll continue to pay for it. 
Rob is frozen. He's frozen. Marlies, can I just turn to you for a second? Because with the switch to online, we've got a lot of people now who 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 didn't know about distance selling and the like. Most of it is 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 pretty straightforward, but there are some things that can be different if you're selling food and drink online now and trying to grow that part of your business. Yeah, I mean, it, it is online is is especially uh, if you don't just sell in the UK, but overseas as well. And uh, it's going to be even more complicated when you when you want to sell into um, the European Union uh, after January. So um, you need to make sure that um, you're compliant with data protection. Um, uh, you need to be sure that you can actually sell into the markets that you want to sell. Um, you need to make sure that you've got all your paperwork sorted out. So yes, definitely that, that, that is sort of something that I think, um, you know, you should really speak, seek specialist advice, whether yes. your processes and your, your website and your platform uh, is compliant. Yeah, with, I know with um, people selling through Amazon for, on food and drink, um, the pan-European option is, of course, disappearing at the end of the year. Yeah. And, of course, VAT rules are, are different in different territories as well. So it's, it's, not, it's not as easy as, as everybody thinks. Um, I know we're going to be doing a webinar the first of well, second week of September, week commencing the 7th to talk about e-commerce and some of the economics around that and, and the sort of risks that are associated with it. But of course, that changing landscape, the fact that you have got a changing market. I mean, Pete, what does the FDF advise people to do in terms of how they should anticipate what the market will look like next year? And of course, how you then put, your, put the, the emphasis and effort. Yeah, I mean, obviously what FDF is doing at the moment is, is, is clearly moving into COVID recovery and working with the government to try and make it smoother transitions we can possibly get. Um, what we're, we're, we've got a list of 90 outstanding questions in terms of the, just the trading aspect of how the European Union and the UK will trade together. But the one area which, which I, would, I would like to call out to anyone on this call is if anyone has got any business in the island of Ireland, please take a really close look at it. Um, there's, there's going to be potentially significant additional paperwork. You know, there's going to be people saying, right, you know, Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland are going to be very different animals in terms of how GB and NI. So I would just shout out to that. The, the other areas that the, the FDF is, is trying to work with is trying to work constructively with the clusters. I mean, Alan's mentioned what big innovation do, but we are very fortunate in Wales that we've got a cluster group across a range of different areas. And again, I would imagine a lot of people on this call are parts of clusters, but what FDF will be doing, as long as the clusters can do as well, is reach out to other people. You're not on your own. Um, there, there are many challenges. Yes, you've got your own business. There are lots of support networks in Wales that are there to help you. You know, uh, Hugh mentioned the industry board as well, who are very open to different types of things. And so from that point of view, um, FDF, uh, you know, I've, I've recently joined from April and what I've been trying to do is just con work with the team, work with the officials, try and do what we can. We're all, we're all in a similar boat. We all want the food and drink industry to succeed in Wales. It's been a huge success over the last few years. Um, and we just want to play our part to do that and try and help in any way we can. It's interesting what you said about Ireland, though, um, because, yeah. of course, because, of course, a lot of, of our meat, our dairy, butter, cheese and the like, that's fairly integrated with Ireland. Um, you know, I don't not what what sort of implications should be people be looking at from in terms of supply and availability? Yeah. Well, specific, specifically, what the what the UK government have already announced is is the, clearly the first thing you think of is what happens at Holyhead, uh, and the UK government has announced that they're going to invest and they're going to invest in an additional fifty million, and now is another thirty four million to help Welsh infrastructure. Obviously, that would potentially be also down Fishguard way as well potentially, um, and I think. The issues for Welsh business might be about the, the amount of paperwork, the scale of the import paperwork, the scale of the export paperwork. And critically, you're talking about supply chains. If you've got an integrated supply chain very much in produce, for example, then one day's delay at the port can make the difference between, between that product being viable or not. So, so I mean, I mean, I mean, concerns. Yeah, so for a Welsh food and drink manufacturer who's not quite sure where all the ingredients are coming from because they're using a wholesaler to deliver in, 
it's yeah. probably worthwhile going back and having a look and asking the questions and back to Marley's point about checking what the T's and C's are for that supply in case you are, are left in a difficult position. What, what, what should people, Marley's, be looking at, particularly from a supply side and in terms of either critical deadline, critical dates and or um, planning, you know, how, how far ahead? I mean, uh, there's a, there's a number of things. If you if you uh, trade cross border, um, you have to uh, look whether you've got um, uh, strict delivery deadlines in there, um, and whether you can meet them or not. You have to look at who's responsible, for example, for compliance with laws, because going forward, the laws in the EU and um, the UK could actually differ in terms of food regulation. Um, you ought to check um, on um, what what happens if if there are delays in delivery, um, whether that's actually a termination ground for the contract or not. You ought to look at your jurisdiction clauses. Um, you know what what which which law applies and um, which which courts can actually um, rule on a case. And ideally, at the moment, I would say, if you can't change it, put an arbitration clause in, because arbitration is something that um, is uh, mutually enforceable between the UK and the EU, even after a hard Brexit, because both the EU and the UK are part of the New York Convention. So arbitration is actually a, a pretty good uh, way forward. Um, Again, um, if you then look at sort of like the regulations, um, you ought to make sure that your labeling is correct, uh, both importing and exporting, because that will change. Um, and there's some quite good uh, sort of uh, information on the, on the government helpline. I'm not a massive fan of the art the government has put out last week with all the regional accents. That's a bit too spinny. But if you actually go on the website, there are some um, quite... Uh, uh, you know, easy to read and, and practical guidelines on there. So where Rob and, and Hugh, where we've got um, integrated supply chains, um, we're dealing with currency like uh, Euro for some of the inputs or in maybe even exporting. Is it worth holding Euros? Is it worth buying forward? What, what do you do from a f budgeting and finance point of view on the, you know, on the run up to a potentially volatile period? Hugh, do you want to, do, I mean, do you muck around with euros much? Um, you know, most of our machinery comes from Europe. So that's, you know, when we have kind of bought euros ahead, it's been for big capital investments. Um, you know, obviously we don't buy a lot of stuff on a day-to-day -day basis, apart from spheres and expertise, you know, our IT and these type of things are all from Belgium. But, uh, you know, we haven't mitigated any of that risk, you know, but... Uh, you know, it, it's an interesting one. If you took more of the broader supply, John, it's interesting that the, the retailers are, have already started looking at the problems that might occur this winter. You know, they're trying to get more stuff, more product grown in the UK to, to mitigate their risks. You know, and perhaps that's a message for the people on the call as well is make sure you look at different ranges of sourcing option. You know, if there is problem with products coming from the continent, you know, if you're, you're going to use a, imported Spanish cauliflower for, as an ingredient in January or even to try and look for a UK grown one. You know, I suppose mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's looking at look the different channels where there's options available. And that comes back nicely to what Pete was talking about, planned maintenance and or making sure that you've, you've, you've got all that programmed in well in advance for, for the critical bit. Um, Pete, did you want to just come back on that point? Yeah, I just, I just wanted to, to, to pick up on Hugh's point because uh, we, we um, did something that was quite, because effectively we're food companies, we're not ex foreign exchange experts. And what we did is we put in place an exchange regime, which was basically, it looked forward for the four quarters uh, and you bought 80% of your demand the next quarter, 60% of your demand the following quarter, 40% of your demand the next quarter and 20% of demand the next quarter. And you did that on a rolling basis. And what it basically meant was, instead of trying to, to, to beat the market from an exchange perspective, yes, the market will move anyway, but what it meant was that you were less impacted by the positives and the negatives. So it meant that you were mitigating the risk of currency. You can't change the market, you know, and, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, that personal experience came because in one day, I think if I go back to, I think it was about 2014 maybe, when the, the, the euro went from 125 to 102, 
on the day of my year end and it cost about the, the profitability a million quid, then we needed to make sure that we had some, some certainty. So I, I just wanted to give a practical approach. No, I think that, that is a good point. And I mean, when I was involved in dairy, we used to do that. You, I mean, the, the trick there was to break big contracts up into smaller ones, change the time span of them so that at least, I mean, you can't get it, you can't get it all wrong. You know, you can get lots of small mistakes rather than one whopper uh, in, a, in a way and, and, and create a cliff edge at the same time. Rob, the other way of doing that, of course, is going open book with your, uh, something some of the major multiples are very keen on. Uh, so are you a fan of open book? I've seen it both sides. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure in terms of open book, personally. It depends how open the book is, really, doesn't it? Um, and who's opening uh, it? <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I, you know, I've seen cost plus open book. I think what we've done, which works for us, is we've identified our major cost um, drivers and have hedged those effectively in our contracts. So we have uh, chicken feed would be our big driver. So we have um, a tracker which tracks feed. So yeah. effectively, the cereals market. Um, and rather than arguing about it, we've agreed that 35% of our costs are chicken feed. Um, and therefore, every six months, we'll sit down and discuss um, chicken feed based on a, an, an index, effectively. So it's actually not really a negotiation at all. It's We've all seen what the market's done. We're either giving them something back or they're giving us a bit more. The and that's sharing... That but you, effectively, you're sharing the risk with your with with your with your customer. I mean, back to Marley's point about bargaining power. That's not so easy for smaller people to do, but it's not something that's impossible either, is it? I mean, if you can point to an index or a basket of prices that you then rely on as being the way of arriving at a price. Yeah, and I think there are, there are arguments you can put forward. You can say it's part of good governance, it's part of good business practices or best business practices. And as you mentioned earlier, this sort of like ethos of transparency, it all goes into that. Um, so I think if you can find a mechanism that is actually an objective mechanism, you know, as you said, like index, um, uh, for example, um, then uh, it, it is sort of something that the, the parties both realize they share the risk and it is it is sort of like not one party trying to pull a fast one on the other, which can work quite well. And that actually creates sort of like also an element of trust and a dialogue, which I personally, I, I don't like litigation. I'm not a litigator. I always think you should try and avoid it like the plague. Um, so if you can have a dialogue open, that will actually then also help you if you do need to change your terms uh, of your contract, for example, because the circumstances of delivery are just very, very different. You have a better platform to start that, uh, that, that negotiation or the discussion yeah. rather than sort of like having this adversarial approach. Yeah, I mean, Rob. I mean, obviously, uh, there's never an adversarial approach with the uh, with the major multiples, obviously. But I mean, where 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 it can get slightly spiky, of course, is when there you know you've got the combination of big price fluctuations and or availability. And we've had a question from Chile about trying to get ingredients from from Italy. But surely the the trick here is to demonstrate, maybe not just with open book, who your suppliers are. What the risks are associated with it and maybe helping your customer come to the decision they need to pay a bit more to ensure they've got a secure supply yeah i think they definitely value availability and security of supply and, it, you know, and, and that changes over time and depending on the circumstances one thing i i would mention though which people are sort of missing in some of this is um is the value of things like brc um, and actually, we, we've talked a lot about understanding your supply base. Well, actually, you know, making sure that you we've mapped our supply base, we've managed their competencies, we've done internal audits on our suppliers. Um, and in doing that, you've got a process that you can also demonstrate to your customers. Um, so yeah, the safety know, element of it, the food safety element of it. The, the food safety, but, you know, actually, food safety is essentially risk management as well, isn't it? So. Yeah. Going doing that due diligence and that process to present it to your ultimate customers. I think if you're going to just go to a, cust a major retailer and say, yeah, we, we, we buy something here, we buy something there, we might see a bit of risk. Um, 
it's there's not really going to wash. You know, the the complexity of the supply chains and the supplier approval processes that they use, you really have to start to think about whether you mirror it within your own business. Um, actually, with IT, it's not very expensive now. Um, so I, one of the things you know we've got is a, a supplier approval process for Capeston, where we see all of our suppliers um, in, in a sort of tree, uh, a triage. So we can actually see who, where the interconnections are. Um, now, Capeston, in this sense, is a tiny business. Now, I've done that in a retail business, and I've been able to go back eight or nine, maybe 10 um, steps down the supply chain um, to see the whole supply chain in front of us. Um, so I just, yeah, we we're sort of talking about risk, and I was just thinking we've not mentioned the auditing and the mm -hmm. interface, but actually from a BRC and other we expect should yes because when, when it goes wrong it costs money so you know it's a it's a it's a really good point actually because you know having that secure supplier base which is um foods not just safe but qual quality avoids mistakes and avoids variances that end up costing money i think we're getting we're getting close to the point at which we'll have to sum up so um what i'm going to do is go around you all and say can i have um, one prediction, I know that's not fair, but one prediction for, for how we're going to get through the rest of this year. Um, one top tip. Um, Alan, can I start with you, please? Uh, what, what do you think is going to happen and what's your top tip? Well, I'm going to confound you and say I haven't got the slightest idea, John. And go on from that to say what I would always advise people to do is build up a business model and Coming back to what I think Pete was uh, implying, uh, once you've got your business model, you can start playing what if with it. Uh, and when you are doing the impossible, which is forecasting, it is impossible to forecast. Yeah. Uh, but when you are putting down into your business model uh, the structure of your business, you can then start playing what if with it and make sure that there is, if at all possible, enough of a buffer that come what may, you will survive. So it's basically things like, if customers don't pay on time, how much free cash have we got to see us through that period? Or what work, additional working requirements might, might we need? Or, you know, where prices yeah, might change? Absolutely, John. And again, I do know how easy it is for me to sit here and uh, come out with these uh, pearls of wisdom. Uh, but play what if, what, what does happen if you lose your main uh, your main supply, uh, main supplier, or your main customer. Uh, there are certain circumstances where no business would survive, obviously. Yeah. Uh, but the more mitigation you can put in there to address loss of clients or whatever, uh, the the more likely you are to survive even the pandemic that we are going through at the moment. And it's worth mentioning at this point on the Welsh Food and Drink website, there's a lot of guidance notes, both in terms of operational, financial and legal and, uh, and the like. So it's well worth people taking some time to go and have, have a look at that. Marlies, could, uh, one prediction and one top tip, please. Yeah, uh, my prediction, I mean, you, lawyers are usually extremely pessimistic, so I'm going to back the trend. I'm not going to be quite so pessimistic. I actually have great hopes in maybe not so much a vaccine, but in treatments for, for COVID. Um, there is sort of like quite a new, uh, uh, quite a lot of development going on. So I think that we may sort of like not see this massive second and third wave that um, some people are, are worried about, but more sort of like smaller localized ones, uh, which is going to be good for business. And with Brexit, I think, even though at the moment it does look like very, very hard, I think this is going to be more like Switzerland and we will see before the end of the year a kind of agreement even though it may be just a very woolly loose one but i think it there will be a start of an ongoing negotiation and again i think that would be good for the food and drink industry. thank you marlies I'm, I'm going to write that one down and, and, and hold you to that one um, i'd probably be totally wrong i have been totally wrong before but uh, it would be nice if it if i were okay. right and in terms of top tips i think uh, yeah get your get your labeling sorted out sooner rather than later because uh, that will you know, be something that you have to do anyway. And if you are importing uh, just Europe at the moment and you don't have one, get an EORI number. Okay, okay. Pete, prediction and top tip. Interestingly, the prediction for me, I share Marley's um, 
conditional excitement, let's put it that way, about the fact that we might actually get some form of a deal. I don't think it's going to be a cliff edge on the 31st of December. I think they're going to be able to wrap something up and say, look at this deal that we've got. Right, let's talk about it some more. So that, that's, that's what I would anticipate. The other thing I would anticipate is this China situation is not going away. No. Um, and uh, whether that affects us, a lot of food supplies that come from China. Obviously, there's a lot of other supplies that come from China, and that's, that is going to be a feature of the next six months. What it actually looks like, I don't know. And the one tip I would give, uh, well, I'll give you two tips, but the first tip I would give is um, try and look at your business from your customer's viewpoint. Start from your customers and what do they need from you, and then start to work from there. And the final thing, just because there's sources of information anywhere, but please feel free to contact me or I'll go to the SDF website. We've got lots of guidance, lots of information across all these various different topics because it's not just Brexit that's coming, obesity is coming as well as the, obviously the green recovery. Yeah, no, that's great. Rob, can I, um, prediction and top tip? Prediction without any particular time scale on it. Um, one of the major multiples to disappear um, either to be absorbed, bought, changed, um, potentially due to the rise of online. Um, yeah. And then in terms of top tip, um, it, it would really be around communication with stakeholders, whether it's customers, suppliers, banks. Um, but if you're not talking to them and keeping them informed about what's going on, um, the, the surprise element of dealing with things just get so much harder. So just manage your communication with your stakeholders. So, management by no surprises. Hugh, prediction and top tip. I suppose the prediction is there's going to be a heap of churn in the next 12 months and there is a, there's a heap of threats, you know, COVID, Brexit, these things, but with threats come opportunities with people wanting to realign their supply chains, etc. So the businesses that are on their toes and, you know, take those opportunities, you know, we'll, we'll be able to grow over the next year as well. You know, there's going to be winners and losers, I think. Um, top, tip. top tip is, you know, as you say, honesty, transparency, forecasting, exactly what Rob just said, you know, it's communication with all your stakeholders, your suppliers, your customers, giving them all. Don't do it on your own. Do, do, it, do it in conjunction with your suppliers and your customers. Yeah, because, you know, they, you can help solve their problems as well. You know, you all solve your problems together. Yeah. Yeah. Hugh, that's great. Thank you. Can I thank all our panellists very much indeed for getting up this time and giving your time so generously. It's really appreciated. Thank you. Thank you to all the people who've been online and um, your Q&As and, um, and what have you. Thank you very much indeed. Just to remind you, 5th of August, we have another one of these and we're talking about managing cash and accessing short-term debt. So um, I think that's probably going to be very topical. Once again, thank you for uh, joining us at this time in the morning and um, Hopefully see you at the next one. Thank you all.